Well, welcome everyone. We are here on this beautiful rooftop in uh, Midtown Manhattan on a gorgeous September day, uh, here to talk about the state of B2B payments, uh, which we can uh, see is the report that we've con constructed here. So we've taken our 500 customers uh, and done a lot of data analysis to understand how our customers are currently getting paid, industry trends and benchmarking information. Uh, and that's what we're here to discuss today. We are Upflow, I'm the CRO, Brad Cross, uh, and we are the leading cash collection solution for B2B businesses to revolutionize how they get paid. That will be the only plug for today. Uh, and from here, I'll go into uh, introductions from uh, every one of our esteemed members of the panel. Hi everyone, my name is Guru. I'm a CPA and I'm uh, currently a senior accounting manager at Regal.io. Hi, I'm Lauren Pearl and I'm a fractional CFO for startups and small businesses. Hi folks, my name is Matt Hennessy. I lead our enterprise platform partnerships team at Stripe. Stripe is a payments and financial infrastructure company that enable businesses of all sizes to run their business online. Hi everyone, my name is Kum and I lead payments initiatives at Upflow. Good, so uh, as I mentioned, we're gonna talk through three key insight areas from the report. Um, one of the first things that struck me in the report when we're thinking about risk of non-payment, especially by industry, um, was that the data seems to suggest, and I think we've got a, a graphic we can show on this, the data seems to suggest that if uh, invoices are not paid within the first one to 30 day late period, the first overdue period, there's a very high likelihood they're gonna end up in the 90 day plus overdue bucket. Um, and therefore there's quite a low propensity to pay those invoices in those two middle segments in the uh, 30 to 60 and 60 to 90 day payment bucket. So I think the question for the, for the panel, so do we think that that draws us to a conclusion that there's such a thing as good and bad payers, or do we think there's another trend that that's showing there? And that's maybe a question for you, Guru. Um, I think that observation is pretty consistent with what I've seen from my experience handling the billing side over multiple startups. Uh, but to indicate whether they're good or bad payers, I think what I've noticed is, sure, in the first 30 days, you know, if they don't pay, it does tend to age much later. and the number one culprit I've seen is that it's usually going, the invoice is usually going to the wrong contact and it just gets lost in the, the system of um, your customer. So it tends to get further out before it's resolved. Um, outside of that, I think some things we've done is we'd follow up with various contacts and ask them for an accounts payable, accounting department kind of contact and usually the issue gets resolved there. Okay. So more often than not, that's a, you, would you class that as a data problem or a technology problem or a process problem? It's a process problem. Uh, that's something I've seen on our side. Like we signed a contract with a vendor and it's the person who signs it who gets the invoice. And if it's a high level executive, they don't even see it. Um, and then eventually it gets to a point where you may see it over multiple reminders and like, oops, sorry, hey, Guru, could you take care of this bill? Um, and that's what we tend to see happen. Okay. Is that consistent with your experience as well? Or? Yeah, much to Guru's point, I feel like when you see that late payment, it can be an indication of a red flag of might be a bad player but it, or payer, but it's not necessarily a bad payer. It's just a hint that it might be going that direction. But there also might just be something logistical going on right? There's a narrative behind why that payment's late. And sometimes it's simply, it went to the wrong email. Maybe actually making the payment is challenging. Something's wrong with your technology and making that payment, whether it's like entering your ACH or getting the check delivered or whatever, there's an issue there. So it could just be kind of, there's a problem with payment. The other thing could be, it could indicate someone who's not able to pay on time. And that's sort of what you've got to suss out. Is this someone who's having trouble paying because of something my company did with the system? Or is the issue on their side and for some reason they don't either feel the urgency to pay or maybe pay at all, or if there may be in some situation where they can't pay. And to build up on that, focusing on the right hand of this tail, which is like the 60, 90 days plus, uh, what's also interesting to keep in mind is that if you've eliminated the technical reasons or the financial reasons, maybe this indicates work that you need to do with your sales or customer success team or your product team because maybe the payment is being withheld or delayed because there is an issue there because they're 
you know, your customer is not getting the support that they want. They're having a product bug that is not getting fixed. And so that is, that may be for some of them, their way of manifesting, manifesting that to you. Would, would you agree? Yeah, and I, I think it's, it's, it's true. It's certainly the case that there are good pairs and that there are bad pairs. You know, I think one of the things at Stripe that we've seen is, you know, we want to focus on good pairs and making sure we're providing the right technology for them to pay in the way that makes the most sense for them. We see a dramatic uptick in conversion for uh, businesses who are offering not just cards, but direct debits um, in, the, in, in, the, in the geography and in the mechanism that the payer is most likely to pay with because maybe they get an invoice, they don't have that payment method on hand, they forget, they're actually a good payer, but it takes them 60 days instead of three days. And so we want to make sure that we're offering the right payment method at the right time to the right buyer. That's more of an enablement topic then in terms of the actual payment experience itself rather than the process for collection. Is that what you're seeing in the in the payments area? Yeah, and, and one thing that I would add also on top of that process-wise that we've seen quite a lot and might probably you're aware of this in the enterprise uh, <laughs> uh, territory is the infamous PO number, which is uh, you get the wrong PO number or you don't have it because you don't understand like the vendor's payables process at your enterprise customer or you know government uh, and you're in for a potential like 30, 60 days ride uh, into like into like that process. So uh, I think making sure that even before ahead of invoicing, you have the right contacts information, but also the technicals for accounting or fitting in to your customers' payables processes is, is, is of course key because sending the invoice is one thing, but maybe you missed something earlier. Um, okay, very, very interesting. So let's think about high risk industries versus low risk industries. And in the report, we pulled up some industries like security and compliance uh, and identity and office and facilities management. Um, these are the kind of industries that are seeing much higher at risk rates. So 60, 70% revenue at risk over overdue over 90 days. Any thoughts on what might be driving that? Again, Lauren, maybe from, from your experience? Yeah, I think this kind of points to breaking payment and timing of payment down into like a couple of different drivers that I think about when I'm uh, serving a CFO for a company. And I think the industry specific stuff speaks to norms and incentives, right? We've talked a lot about kind of the logistics of payment, how easy it is. We talked a little bit about like following up and sort of that implementation of making sure it's not just gone to the wrong email or maybe gotten forgotten. But industry incentives, I think, play a huge role. So industry, there are certain norms, right, of how many days payable is typical. Like as a vendor, you might decide you want to get paid on a net 15 basis, but the norm might be 90 days, right? That just might be how everybody does it. And it may be really challenging to buck that norm unless you're doing something really special that people really want. Um, in terms of leverage and kind of incentives, if you're giving all of your value up front and receiving payment after, of course, there's the desire to do good business and pay on time as sort of like a moral incentive. But if the company that's paying doesn't get anything after that payment, there isn't really kind of an intrinsic motivation there. And so it can be interesting to think about what can be done such that there's still a motivation, whether there's the ability to have repeat business where you have to maintain the relationship, maybe holding something over until payment has been made, um, offering some kind of discount or incentive for paying early. Um, that, that's another factor that has to be considered. And Guru, how do, you, how do you do that in your business? What are the sort of levers that you can pull to try and ensure that you've got some leverage to get paid more quickly? So we work in a software business and there's implementation involved. So one of my new processes that I implemented is I go down the list of customers that are ongoing implementation. And if they have an overdue invoice, it's, we tell our, yeah, if we need to, we will use that as leverage to uh, expedite payment. So that's uh, a pretty, I think, useful lever that you can use. And ultimately, as a software company, there is the shutoff mechanism, I like to call. Um, we are kind of tweaking with at what day we want to create an automated shutoff. But right now, we're thinking keeping it like around the 90 day mark. If a customer is overdue, by 90 days, we have an automated process which shuts off the service temporarily until we receive payment. So I think it's a great question. You need to look at your business and see where you have leverage and utilize those to uh, obtain cash if you can. Do you think 
do you think at a very basic level, uh, simply showing that you have a tight process, you know, invoicing, like for billing, that you offer, you know, easy payment options, uh, multiple payment options, and that you send the invoice on time, you know, all of these basics, uh, just checking those is already a significant uh, step, you know, in, ensure, in ensuring that how, in what you've seen in, the, in your previous experiences. 100%. Um, even to this day, I don't understand why, but we still have customers that send checks um, and that obviously slows down payment. But to your point, just offering the flexibility of uh, different options of just to get paid is um, a great way to make sure that uh, your invoices are paid on time. Um, I think in a alternate timeline, I'd like to experiment with just not accepting checks whatsoever and just it's either cash or credit and see how that impacts our like our DSO as an example. But um, given the current macroeconomic environment, it's best not to play games with a customer. Can I ask a question? What, what are some of the um, reasons that you find that your customers are intent on paying with check? Is it just the way that it's done? Is it perceived as cheaper? Is it perceived as safer? What, is, what are some of those reasons? I think there's some accountants who are just stuck in their own ways of, like, I've met accountants who still print copies of invoices and file them away into a cabinet. Whereas like to this, there's no reason why that needs to exist today, right? Everything exists like in the cloud. Um, so it's honestly, it's not a great answer, but it's just people who are stuck in their own ways. To give some, to, I guess to look at in another side of it is uh, with checks, you can have certain controls where like if it's over a certain dollar threshold, you can have you know multiple signatures on a check to indicate approval, but today, with with all the banking systems like there's these controls can be implemented that way too so um, just simply they're just used to an older process i would echo that actually and that it seems to be specific as well to certain industries where the norms are really strong i deal with a couple of clients in the real estate space and they're very much this is how we've done it for years and years and years um, and also a coordination problem. If they're all kind of doing it one way, even that's an antiquated way, there's, co there's so much coordination of so many parties yeah. that changing it has a really high cost. Yeah. So you'll, you'll find that as well. Um, so, and I've also seen a little bit of hesitance sometimes around like security and controls, yeah. even though checks these days might actually not be much more secure than a lot of other forms of payment, there's still that sense of security. And so folks will sometimes cling onto that a bit. Yeah, makes sense. I, I think it sort of stresses the importance of showcasing, you know, for something like ACH debits, which is, you know, you're using the accounting and routing number that's that's printed on the check um, and showcasing how much easier that can be for the business, um, for their back office. Um, it also facilitates faster payment. And so I think it's really important that we continue to showcase how um, technology does enable um, cheap, fast, reliable forms of payment um, and just showcasing the value to sort of, you know, all stakeholders in that value chain. So this is the perfect segue into the second interesting topic area, which is looking at the power of online payments, right? And I think the stat that, that stuck out to me most glaringly in the report, uh, the second stat is the uh, impact on average payment delay of the percentage of credit card payments that you're taking. So if we think about people that are rarely using cards and rarely using cards, we define those as under 20% of payments on cards. The average payment delay is 15 days, whereas the people that are using cards more prevalently, over 40% of their payment mix is on cards, then the average payment delay drops to one day. So I think it's, 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 it's a phenomenal stat and a huge impact on businesses. But if I can just throw out some kind of myths about payments in the B2B space and get your response, um, things that we hear are preconceptions like credit cards don't work for high value transactions. Um, and we hear things like, you know, there's too many technological hurdles in the way, and then the fees are too high to make it worthwhile. So can I get your thoughts on, on those kind of historical preconceptions and how valid you think they are in, in today's world? Uh, so which one would you want to start with? Let's start with the top one. Let's look at high value transactions. High value transactions. Yeah. So. This one I think is a bit more of a nuanced conversation just because like if you have a customer that you deem it's a credit risk, then I think you know just eating the credit card fee is a well worthy investment. Mm -hmm. But if it's something where you know it's a matter of you collect a payment within 60 days rather than 30 days, you know, if you're 
a cash strap startup, I think it's might be worthwhile in that instance to uh, delay the payment a bit just so you can make sure you hold on to as every valuable dollar as you can. How about you, Matt, in your experience yeah, I, with Stripe? I think, you know, we see um, across the Stripe network, we, we see lots of high value transactions with cards. I think to your point, if you have, there is an element of, of credit risk, certainly, um, you, but you could see that with a check bouncing also. Um, and so if you have good fraud detection sort of associated with, uh, with online payments, we see the value of that conversion and you see it in the data that the, the time to get paid is dramatically faster. Um, we see that as a really strong value driver for, for businesses getting paid. I see it sometimes as well in industries where um, a vendor is sort of doing like some factoring and reimbursables and they find that credit cards can be a really useful tool for sort of paying for something up front and then being paid on the back end. So you'll end up using that credit line to do a lot of purchasing before they actually invoice their own client. So I see a lot of, especially, you know, traditional credit lines and lending with interest rates so high, you're sort of looking for creative solutions. So I'm seeing a lot more high value transactions happen in that area. So I took a look at our own data uh, for Q2 24 in the US and for high ticket transactions, basically above 20K, uh, the average on upflow is actually 35K and the biggest one was 600K. Uh, so high value transactions, uh, echoing Matt's point, do happen with cards. And I think it has to do, and you let me know your thoughts on that, on the two sides of the equations, like why as a customer would I pay such a high value you know, over card and why as a merchant would I accept that? Uh, on the customer side, I think there are some incentives. Um, you, you've touched upon this, but if you use a credit card, well, I mean, you know, maybe I wanna pay for that transaction and then settle it you know, in, a few, in a few days at the end of the month. Uh, maybe my uh, corporate card is on a rewards program and I actually get some cash back or some uh, you know, rewards or miles or, uh, anything like that uh, with those purchases. And on the merchant side, it's also a cost decision in the sense that yes, maybe it's going to you know, involve me uh, accepting a two, 3% cost to get that payment, but I get it today instead of in 15, 30, 45, 60 days, and I don't have to finance that gap or I don't have to wait, you know, and you know, maybe I, I'll have an unexpected expense tomorrow or something like that. The good thing is that, you know, for example, in Upflow, we've also built some cost sharing tools where you can pass uh, on part or all of that uh, card transaction fees to some customers. So that, so that also helps recoup a few points of margin. So um, I, I don't know, I'm curious to understand if you think there are other uh, incentives to doing that, but those are the main ones that I see even for high value, high value transactions. I think it's a great point to kind of break down the incentives between the payer and the payee, because really the person getting paid is who's paying those fees and has really that trade off. Um, I think another interesting factor that can make it worth paying those fees can be the fact that more folks in the organization could make the payment without necessarily having a discussion or getting an approval. Because a lot more folks in the company have company credit cards than have ACH information. So if you are selling services B2B, it might be a way to get that bill paid faster, easier by the direct point of contact who's seeing the value that is getting delivered um, and, and can kind of not make that a long drawn out process of dealing with the finance department and all those sorts of things. You're referencing new tools for payables, right? That allow to deploy credit cards or debit cards like across your organization for expenses and well, expense policies. Yeah, right? those are certainly in place, but this has been true for a really long time, right? Corporate credit cards, I know, and you know, when I was a Deloitte employee, we all got our corporate credit cards that we'd yeah. use to book our travel and get our meals and expenses and this sort of thing. And so um, there's always sort of been uh, this ability to kind of distribute expenses throughout organizations. And with that distribution, it means that the approval process happens after the expense has already been incurred, not before you get paid. And that's really powerful if you're sitting there waiting to have your bill paid. Right. I think what you're, what you're sort of getting at is I think the other piece is, yes, there are incentives for the payer, but it's also just easier. And what's really important in payments is making sure that you provide the easiest payment method for the customer wherever they are. That's super critical. Again, you're sort of seeing that in the data. Um, yes, there are incentives, but I think just making sure the transaction is as low friction as possible will not only ensure that you're getting the payment, but that you're getting it as quickly as possible. Yeah, that's true. I think it's true for high value transactions, but also lower value transactions. Sometimes some of our own, some of our merchants, uh, you know, tell us like, 
I don't really think my customers want to pay by card. And you know, we work with them to be, well, try it. And you'll see, worst case, you'll get paid just like you are paid to, getting paid today. And you know, nothing's changed. Best case, which happens 100% of the time, you are able to move some payments online. Yeah, and get people to stop paying by check, as you mentioned right. before, and start them paying on uh, more yeah. immediate online. And I mean, I, I am one of those people that I'm shocked by how many people are our customers that do end up paying by card. Um, just me being on the other side of things, I try to make sure, I think it's because I handle like, a lot of the banking side anyway, so paying by ACH is not a problem but for me. So if we can avoid any additional fees, like as a job, as an accountant, that's part of my job. Uh, but yeah, I am surprised by uh, how many, or I guess how, how easy it makes it for other customers to uh, pay up the bills. And we've, we've had one step further than that upflow, right? We've had a couple of customers that have come on board where they've actually stipulated before signing the contract, and these are high value contracts, $100,000 a year, that kind of thing. And they've actually stipulated before signing the contract that they would only sign the contract if we were able to take a virtual credit card as a payment. So they're mandating that payment method pre-sale, which is you know not, not, uh, not in line with uh, some of these preconceptions about how impractical those credit card payments are. Um, do you think we see a difference in culture in the US versus the rest of the world, the European Union, for example, in terms of how people think about credit cards and utilize them? Yeah, I think from Stripe's perspective, definitely. I mean, card usage is is incredibly high um, in, in the US. Um, in Europe, we see a higher penetration rate of direct debit, SEPA in the, uh, the European Union, BAX in the UK, see BAX in Australia. Um, and, and again, to the point of, um, it should be as easy as possible to collect payments, be that payment, um, you know, a credit card, um, you know, uh, direct debit, other forms of, of bank, bank transfer, other wallets. Um, but yeah, it's really important to think outside of just cards because there are some customers who um, don't have the same incentives on cards, don't find it as easy to pay with cards. Um, and for one reason or another, will come to you and say, I need to be paying by my um, local bank transfer method. And it's really important to be able to meet that customer where they are and have that, that payment method available. Yeah, I think we see that as well. In Europe, people are much more open to direct debit. Uh, whereas in the US, that seems to be something that's got a bit more hesitance and a bit more resistance. Whereas in Europe, it seems to be something that people sign up for quite easily. So I think in the US, just on, on direct debit, I think the, it's just been historically quite clunky um, we're trying to change that. Um, we want to make it easier to, to verify a bank account that's tied to an ACH direct debit payment. I think you can do that with Upflow today. Um, but there is just some of that cultural you know, payment behavior where in Europe they're, um, they're more familiar with, um, with, with bank transfers. But I think the, more, the culture over here is, is much more that people are open to auto pay on cards, right? Whereas I think that's something that there's been a bit more resistance perceptually, in, in my perception at least, in, in the European Union. So again, if we've got people who are prepared to sign up with a card or to pay, then that gives us that pool payment dynamic as well, just with their chosen payment method. Right? I wonder about uh, the differences in industries or business models, even like B2B, B2C. Uh, I mean, you all have experiences in different fields. So how do you feel about this in terms of adoption of either of those? Where are those? sectors uh you know on the spectrum from zero online to 100 percent online sitting like what have you seen in your careers and your experiences on that i think there's definitely differences in industry norms as we've kind of already spoken about just in terms of how most of the players around you are doing payments and how often the transactions happen i think if i'm thinking about like big swaths the trend might be more about the age of the or individual that's sort of in charge of deciding the payment method, right? Like payments have evolved a lot in the past, say, 30 years. And wherever you kind of started your career, I imagine there's some comfort in doing things the way that you've already always done them. I think too, something that I've noticed as a CFO working with lots of different um, CEOs is just the degree of emotion involved in financial transactions. Mm -hmm. And because of course we can kind of look at these things, research these things and say, actually one form of payment is technically safer than another. Another form is technically faster than another. So there's almost a, a lot of objective realities we could discover about different payment methods. 
but that doesn't feel like it matters to folks as much as it should because it's so emotional. It's always scary to make a payment. And so you kind of seek out the form where you just feel the most comfort and the least friction for your you know, former experiences making payments. Do you feel that a generation, you know, that has seen the transformative, uh, the big transformation in the payments world the B2C, you know, contactless, Venmo's, all of that is more prone to deploy, you know, in the B2B world as they get into the workplace or evolve, you know, in their careers to be those agent of change? Or, or do you think it's like a separate topic because, because it's a separate topic? <laughs> I think that's, um, that's very accurate. Um, you know, it's funny, like talk to various customers, you see what things they're comfortable with and what they're not comfortable with. Like I had customers who were willing to give me their like their entire credit card information over the phone. Uh, whereas like personally, if anyone ever asked me for my credit card information over the phone, I'd think twice about doing that. Um, so I think it's um, I think it's well said that it's especially with our generation as we come into higher positions, then will be like the agents of change around how payments are done. Yeah, and I, I think it's just that the, the, the concept of, you know, making payments um, continue to become more frictionless. You know, I, I'm a Stripe link user, which is sort of our one-click checkout functionality. I was buying a blender for my brother online. And just the, the concept now of like entering my credit card information over and over again is becoming um, more and more foreign. Um, and I think that that mentality We've seen that bleed over in, into more of the B2B space. Um, and, and certainly in the B2B space, we see more, um, especially as the order values go up, more ACH payments and, and bank transfer payments. Um, but I think what like time and again we see is most critical is optionality, whether that's a customer or whether that's a business, making sure you're offering the dynamic payment method that makes sense for a customer given their location um, and what payment method they have on hand to be the really the most important thing. So uh, building up on the B2C and B2B like dynamic, uh, one thing that we've seen evolve over the past years in B2C is BNPL and in B2B it seems to be very nascent, the early beginnings. Is this something that you're observing that there is increasing demand for those kind of you know, optionality, which is a little bit akin to credit, like it's halfway between a credit card and like actual credit. So like financing. Yeah, certainly in, in our space, you know, BNPL, the traditional, you know, pay in for over time, we're actually seeing those options expand to be to be more flexible. And then on the B2B side, I would I think the analog is we've seen just more creativity around, uh, you know, invoicing and invoice factoring and, you know, charging certain amounts um, over over time, I'm curious your your perspective on this, but we do see, um, you know, again in the B2B space, a lot more creativity in sort of payment plans, um, and and that's to the point you need to make sure that you have the right payment method on file, that it's easy for that transaction to go through on a recurring basis, um, so that when you do set up the the right payment plan, that it's easy to process that transaction every time, versus like imagine doing that by, you know, having someone send you a check you know, every week to set them on the right, you know, uh, SaaS payment plan. Yeah. yeah, I'm seeing a lot of that kind of creative factoring and these different kind of faculties. Again, I, I chalk it up a lot to interest rates and the fact that, you know, liquidity is expensive right now. And so you're seeing a lot of different um, providers kind of providing some of those, you know, get paid earlier, you know, um, kind of taking on a little bit of that same risk if you if you don't get paid outright and maybe some fees. Um, I think that's also sometimes a good incentive to use a given payment platform. It's a nice kind of little treat to offer to sweeten the deal of, you know, you can use our platform because we're going to be able to get you paid sooner and we'll take a little of that risk and we'll get you the cash you need immediately while we wait for your customer to pay. So I think it's also just become kind of a trending thing that people are, are offering. Um, but yeah, there needs to be a solution because whenever capital is expensive, there's that challenge between when you get paid and when you have to pay your own bills and, and making that kind of equation work. So Guru, I'm really interested to hear how you guys think of this, because obviously you have software subscription revenue, but you also have usage revenue as well. So you have those two different types of uh, billing that's going on within your business. Have you thought about 
factoring, buy now, pay later, anything like that within your business? How, how far down that road have you guys got? Um, right now, we're sticking to like net 30 payment terms, regardless of um, um, like what happens within their usage. We had some customers like reach out um, asking for, you know, more flexibly around payments. And, uh, you know, it, it depends on like the relationship we have sometimes you know, payment terms are the payment terms that we agreed on and you have to kind of be the bad guy. That's like part of my job is to say, hey, we, this is what we agreed to. Um, it's 90 days, we expect payment now. But um, if it's a strategic account, I can see us being a bit more flexible in those scenarios and offering a more flexible payment option there. Okay. And how does the payment behavior change by those different types of invoicing from the subscription to the usage? In, in terms of, do you see people more prepared to sign up for auto pay on one versus mm -hmm. another and different payment methods or how do they how do they think of paying those bills across those two different areas? Yeah, so regarding the usage side of things, we that can be a little bit tricky. So we try to be as uh, transparent ahead of time. So they're aware that they are going to go into like overage billing. So it's not a surprise that, um, you know, a month into it, they might get a new invoice because then that will result into this, uh, this game where you have to uh, explain away what's happening and that could result in invoice being like significantly delayed. So we try to get ahead of it and provide that transparency. So there's no surprises when the invoice comes out. I think that helps a lot to ensure that we ideally get paid for those usage invoices uh, in a timely manner. Cool. And do you see a prevalence to sign up for auto pay or pool payments on one type of revenue versus another? Or? I think typically, for sure, if it's uh, if it was just the a fixed amount that happens every month, I think it makes a lot of sense for someone to sign up for auto pay for that. Right now, um, we have customers who do go into usage, but because they've already agreed to the auto pay, like th there's no separation between what they're being billed just for the prepayment versus their overages fees. So th there's no separation there. And, uh, and related to that, Matt, you mentioned the creativity that yeah. you're uh, observing. I'm thinking about those new business models, you know, that are very driven by usage, pay as you go, prepaid, postpaid, with, you know, various uh, ways you can implement them, you know, stair step, et cetera. Uh, is that the kind of tools that you know Stripe is building is uh, is building to like fit those business model and how to get paid uh, with those? I assume different payment methods along the way. And, uh, yeah, yeah, no, ab absolutely. I mean, I think in the the old world we were seeing you know one fixed payment method over a set period of time. Um, we now work with um, tons of customers who do metered billing. They do usage based billing. Um, they obviously are. Um, accepting various payment methods. They explore um, different trials. They do A-B testing, um, you know, to offer different rates over different plans. And so we, we see a ton of flexibility um, in terms of B2B payments and invoicing um, to ensure that, you know, they're striking the right balance between um, getting paid as quickly as possible, but also enabling that flexibility for their customers and trying out different methods of getting paid to see what what resonates for, for their particular customer base. Yeah. And Lauren, you mentioned perception and preconception there. And I think I've, I've seen different attitudes in different customers. So some of them say, uh, you know, we have a regular structural license billing and I'm fine for that to go on auto pay because I know that's going out every single month. But the usage fees, I want to have some level of control over that. And then at the other end of the spectrum, I've seen people say, well, the usage fees, we've obviously used that. So we're fine to sign that up, up, up on auto pay. But our annual or quarterly bill, which is a lot larger, I don't want to set that up on auto pay. I want to have some control over when that goes out. So I'm just trying to, I'm trying to get a feel for if you think that's a customer by customer mindset preconception or if you think there's some providing themes that exist in in what you've seen oh i think that's it's a really complicated one because i think there's a lot of layers i will say that um, subscription payment is kind of this amazing thing i think that's become more popular in like the past 10 years because of the SaaS boom and it's interesting because it's great for when you're getting paid with you know, an MRR because you get that payment consistently each month, which has caused explosive growth for a lot of companies. And on the payer side, it's also very nice because there's so much predictability. And, um, and 
as a business operator, even if you ultimately may be paying more, that predictability is very, very valuable uh, in terms of predicting your own expenses, your own revenue, anticipating what it's gonna take to cover your next month. So it can be really great. Um, I think when you're talking about kind of the transparency of pricing and having that variable pricing, um, a lot of that can have to do with kind of the perceived value of what you're getting. And um, there's sort of this uh, agreement when you're signing up to a subscription that there is some kind of consistent value being delivered or being received. So what I've seen, at least in my customers, my B2B customers, is when there's a lot of scrutiny on that price, it could be a sign that it's because the, the customer, that their customer is struggling and they're looking to cut, but it also can just be about the value hasn't been consistent, and so they're scrutinizing that payment a little more. But subscriptions are, I think, from a payment, when you're looking at the difference in um, getting paid, doing an auto pay where they consistently just get charged month after month after month, it's, um, the, I imagine the day's payable is quite low. <laughs> I, I'm actually curious if there's been, um, if, if either Upflow or Stripe has any kind of studies into the difference in days payable for subscriptions versus for like fixed payments. Uh, so we don't have that level of details. However, uh, in, in terms of what's a subscription or what's a fixed um, uh, billing, uh, but on AutoPay, what we've seen is that some of our merchants were able to convert up to about 30% of their payments into recurring payments with our, our AutoPay feature. I mean, we have one, some other tools have one, but, uh, and that's really impactful and meaningful because you now, you can now actually be a business that is fundamentally not necessarily, you know, subscription driven or, you know, have uh, uh, more one shot than recurring business, but actually turn your payments into uh, more recurring ones. You know, a classic example would be a design agency, you know? Uh, okay, so you have a contract and you may get some work at a more or less recurring frequency, but if you work with the same customers over time uh, you and you have their card, payment uh, or, or a direct debit on file, then you can transform what is somewhat recurring business into actually recurring payments. So that's really helpful because it saves you a lot of time. Uh, it saves you a lot of risk as well, uh, specifically for agencies. Uh, we've known agencies that, you know, you send an invoice, send two invoices, they're not paid after four or five months. And then, you know, the business is shut down and you've worked essentially for free. And it's actually even worse than free because you've uh, paid out your cost, you know, personnel and production costs. So uh, that's actually really helpful, not only for subscription based businesses, but also for quote unquote more traditional businesses who can uh, uh, turn their payment flow uh, into a recurring thing. Yeah, go, going back to this this concept of auto pay, you know, the, the having a set it and forget it functionality is is really important. You need to make sure that um, there's as uh, you know you're removing all matter of friction. If a card is expired, that you've got the infrastructure to update that card without having, without having to reach out to someone and get their new card on file. You need to be able to retry cards at the moment that they're most likely. Um, to succeed, that's one of the things that we obsess about at Stripe is making sure we're doing all the um, activity in the background to make sure a, a, a payment goes through. Um, but we also see, you know, with some of our SaaS platforms that there is concern on churn and set it, forget it. Someone looks at their bill and they say, oh my gosh, I haven't used this for very, uh, for very long. Um, and then there's this panic. And so having options, um, set it and forget it is great having usage-based billing as, as an option. We see platforms be really successful when they do have different methods by which they can charge customers based on different business models, different payment plans. Um, we find that optionality really important. That makes so much sense too when we go back to talking about the different like tendency to pay on time in certain industries versus others and the difference in leverage because having those flexible options can allow you to match your payment structure to what will give you the most leverage to get that payment given your business model and your industry because it might be wildly different for one company versus another. Uh, Lauren, I'm curious from the CFO perspective, optimizing this payment mix or differentiating you know, across customer segments, uh, how do you approach that, you know, like balancing uh, you know, offering payment methods that might be a bit more expensive, but then, you know, it's a 
financing costs that I don't have to bear and managing risk across all of this, plus the accounting, you know, the FP&A, all of that. Like, how do you how do you approach this as a whole? Uh, yeah, it's a value judgment. I think you kind of have to take all of those factors into account. Um, I think one of the keys uh, kind of to my methodology is I come from startup world. And so experimentation is a huge thing. Um, we can kind of figure out, you know, what is the flow of your project? Who are your customers? How often are you getting paid? What are the norms of your industry? Um, you know, we can lay all this stuff out and we can sort of just try and see what kind of performance we get in terms of, of payments and, 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 and kind of change it as we discover that, oh, wow, that worked really well. Our customers are paying really quickly when you do things that way and it's not a high cost to us. So I think there's a combination of we initially do that planning and, and think about what fee trade-offs are worth making sure we're getting paid on time. But then there's also just implementing and hoping we have a really flexible platform where we can actually flip things around a little bit if we discover there's some leakage, it's not working the way we want to, and optimizing. And how much does the, uh, and this is also a question for you, Guru, as you've approached it at Regal, but uh, how, much, how much does the admin cost, quote unquote, factor in, you know, meaning that okay, it's not only about deploying cars, but do I have a good integration with my accounting? Uh, how easy is it for me to deploy in my tools? Do I have to do some dev work, you know, to put that on the website? Um, how much does that factor into like this, this balance and or has factored at, at your company? I mean, I think also having all this automation working prevents you from needing to hire like a bookkeeper, right? So that's the other admin cost that uh, it's a pretty significant one. Um, at least in my in my case, I'm sure it's probably the same for you as well. Yeah, yeah and like we're seeing this across all software tools for like the accounting tech stack, let's call it that, like from QuickBooks, the automated bookkeeping, uh, upflow with the collections and payments, you know, bill.com for like vendor AP management. So we're starting to see a lot of these tools um, help automate and reduce the the admin costs that you would normally bear by like hiring a bookkeeper. Yeah, I think it's one of those. It's just like one of the factors. So if a method just seamlessly flows into your product really easily, that's a huge benefit. But if no one's going to pay, it's not a benefit that's worth using. Oh, right. Yeah. So you kind of have to weigh, uh, weigh it as one of the factors, but a very important one. So I want to pick up on something you said, Lauren, around uh, creating an approach based on how you think your customers are going to behave and then iterating on that to become more successful over time. That's what we've seen at Upflow is definitely being able to do that customer by customer is understand their business, the cohorts within their business, how to start to communicate with them to try to get paid, then also to think about iterating that process over time. So I'm really interested to hear some of the signals you're looking for in that process and some of the dimensions that you think of to segment those customers by in order to think about how do we approach them differently? Is it product? Is it location? Is it age? Or, you know, any of those other attributes that, that yeah. you think about in that process? I think, so first off, the um, you have to think kind of about who your sticky customers are that have kind of the most patience with you. So I think if you're a startup that's implementing different payment options, the first place to go might be some of those tried and true customers that you have a really personal relationship with, where you can let them know we're experimenting, we're kind of playing with things, we want the payment experience to be better for you, and we're also looking for feedback. Um, I think also customers can be a lot more patient when they know they're actually, that you are looking for feedback. So if they have grumbles, that they can grumble to you. Um, kind of hedging that, that rollout with that um, messaging can really help. So I think it's all about kind of rolling out to those customers where you either feel very confident you're not going to lose them just because they have a few grumbles this, this month. Um, it also can be interesting as you evolve over time, this might be a little more controversial one, but as you evolve over time as a startup, sometimes there are customers that were a great fit when you were little and aren't such a great fit anymore, um, where you're kind of just waiting for them to leave anyway. So those can also be a potential test bed for something like this, um, because you're just not so worried about losing them. Um, another, the next place I typically go with a rollout would be once you've got really good feedback from those core customers, potentially rolling out to new customers who don't have another system that they're already um, tied to and in love with and don't have a change, they simply are just going to do the implementation in a different way. And then kind of finally rolling out to those customers where you know your key 
um, accounts that you really can't lose, that you're a little concerned about, and even potentially, depending on you know the cost to serve, maybe they never get the new rollout if what they're using is working, um, kind of depending, and it's all kind of based on how it works for your company. So that's sort of the, the stag, the, the staging typically that I'd look at for experimentation. I think you're touching on an important point, which is that uh, billing, invoicing, payments, probably shouldn't work in silo. It's not just the finance team or just the person in charge, but it's also involving the sales and success team because the process starts much earlier than issuing the invoices, you know, at the, in the, or finalizing the order, uh, all the way down into the accounting. So uh, I'm curious to, to know what you've seen or what you've actually implemented yourself, you know, in your own experiences, what kind of a, uh, levers or processes do you put in place with other teams to ensure that this is a consistent uh, uh, customer experience, uh, you know, uh, through all of that order to cash cycle? Yeah, well, on the sales side, there's a clawback and commissions if the customer doesn't end up paying their invoice. So that's a pretty significant uh, lever that we can pull. Um, and just like using my order experience, technically it's not a sale if you don't ever get the cash, right? Yeah. Um, so that's something we try to uh, communicate to our sales team to make sure that, hey, just because the customer signs a contract doesn't mean the sale's done. Uh, around the CS team, there is incentives around retention. Um, so that also factors into their comp as well. So they're also incentivized to make sure that the customer like does renew and also does pay their invoices on time. I guess there's a there's a trade-off there as well in terms of getting the customer to pay on time in terms of the nature of the collections discussion or dialogue and the tone of voice within that and the amount they're overdue and then the propensity to renew because of course if we let them get significantly overdue then the tone of voice can get quite pushy because obviously we need to get paid and if we're doing yeah. things like restricting access to the service and yeah. other quite you know strong measures like that then we see that that links to a, a higher propensity to churn at the end of the day so is that what you see as well? And then is that where the customer success vested interest comes in because they don't want to have that situation occur? Yep, and it helps a lot when, you know, CS can always play the good guy and then I'm playing the bad cop. So we have that separation. So the CS team can maintain a healthy relationship with the customer, but I don't have that relationship with the customer. So I'm allowed to be a bit more pushy, a bit more uh, firm with the customer. There's always, I think, a, unless you're doing like product driven sales and very, very automated subscriptions, especially with a low cost, I think there's a lot of coordination that needs to happen between the finance team and the other teams to ensure that you're not messing it up. Like I've seen that at um, a fair number of the companies I've worked with. We do either, you know, depending on the bill cycle, a weekly or a monthly meeting to run through like what's getting invoiced and double check that that is congruent with how the project is going that we're ready for that that things aren't you know delayed on our side especially like there's nothing worse if you have a business that you know especially like your services business and you have complex sales that are very relationship driven and you've just missed a deadline with your client and then finance sends them an invoice you don't want that. <laughs> so um, there is sometimes a, a, a big need for that conversation of when that payment is going to get sent. Um, and if it's not getting paid, why? It can be very helpful. OK, so I think it's a good point to step into the third uh, insight that was from the report. And, and where, we've, uh, where we've got to with the third insight is we've looked much more at DSO benchmarking. So we're looking at by industry, by, benchmark, by, by business model. We talked a little bit about this in the discussion so far. I think if we think about the three categories we've got here uh, and we can pull the, the, the DSO report up and, and flash that on screen, um, we have a contrast between things like service industries, and we talked about this so far, uh, being a bit more slow and steady. So the median DSO for service entries is 60 days uh, and the top 25th percentile in the data that we have is around 42 days. Uh, versus software as a service, the median DSO is 59 days with the, the top 25th being 38 days. So subscriptions driving slightly faster payments. Um, and then physical goods and marketplaces, faster payment turnarounds uh, with those kind of inventory conditions. So I think that's a really interesting uh, topic to dive into and talk a bit more about what we think is driving those trends, what we've seen in our experience and, and talk a bit more about that. So maybe Matt, you want to 
talk to us about different uh, payment in, payment uh, behavior by industry? Yeah, I mean, I think we see, I think the, the um, a, a lot of the issues that we see in sort of in payments timing come from a lot of these industries that are in a more legacy space um, that are trying to move payments online. And so, for example, we'll see, um, you know, in the, we work with a lot of platforms in home services where, um, you know, they want to keep good relationships. Uh, they'll, they'll worry about, you know, charging the customer, um, you know, later on post, um, you know, po post service delivery. And one of the things that we are seeing is, you know, these platforms who enable, you know, at least some form of payment upfront are more likely to get paid in full faster. Um, and so, you know, I think there is this issue of, uh, well, my customer pays, likes to pay in cash or check, um, and I want to be flexible. Um, we, one of the things that we've seen su be successful is platforms that are bringing that payment flow online and actually making it easier for their customer enables them to, you know, bring those, bring those payments forward, even if they're in an industry where cash and check has sort of, you know, ruled the roost for a number of years. And you mentioned going to the customer where they are. Um, that's something that we've seen be really successful. <clears throat> we've had a couple of instances where uh, we have had customers who are paying by check. Uh, and we've identified that they are more inclined to do things on paper in a slightly more archaic way, like, like you mentioned earlier. And so we've been utilized letters and offline communication to actually engage those people to try and migrate them into online payment methods. And that's been really quite successful. So I guess that's something that, that supports the, the point there. Yeah, yeah, and making sure that outreach is, you know, appropriate for, you know, a given customer, whether that's, um, you know, updated invoices over email, you know, texting links to, um, to appropriate payers so that they can, um, they can, you know, pay in the method that makes the, that makes the, the most sense. Um, making sure that those touch points are relevant for the customer and making sure that payments are embedded within that touch point um, so that they can, they can pay as quickly as possible. Well, that's what you said about just making the process as easy as humanly possible to maximize completion. Yeah. Do you see a different payment behavior in terms of the time it takes to get paid between your subscription and your usage revenue? Or is it more customer by customer? Yeah, it definitely works customer by customer. Um, in some instances, we have customers like on auto auto pay, which in that case, you know, it doesn't matter. Uh, but uh, as I mentioned previously, we try to get ahead of like the overage invoices by being transparent with the customer on how much they're utilizing the product. So there is no surprises when they do get the invoice. In the different industries I've been in, I think, um the the norms of the industry itself can make a lot of uh, impact. So again, like the net payable, you hear this a lot. I grew up in uh, retail and um, you hear net 30 all the time, net 30, net 30, net 30, net 30, meaning you, you know, you got your goods in the door and you didn't have to pay for them for 30 days, which was really essential to how the business worked because you had 30 days to sell the goods um, before you actually had to pay the, the manufacturer you got them. And the whole industry was kind of baked into that cycle. And, um, and so you could imagine no one's paying before net 30. There's no early payment in that industry because it's almost like a machine that works with that rhythm. So you have those sort of norms of um, how it's always been done for years. You have that norm of like logistics of when you could actually physically make the payment given what you are doing as a payer in that given transaction. Um, and then there is kind of that, that other factor we're talking about, which is the ease of payment and how friction less can you make it such that when you do decide to go that pay, do that payment, it's done. Um, immediately, which speeds up the cycle too. And some industries are really quick to adopt those those new innovations and other industries are not quick to adopt them. And so we'll be really slow at doing um, any of those kinds of improvements. Uh, you know, between the tension that you want to get your receivables paid as fast as possible, but you also, you know, don't want to pay uh, your vendors uh, necessarily too quick because you have working capital to manage. How do you play fair, you know, in that equation on, on, on both sides? Yeah, I mean, I think the assumption, so it's funny, I do a lot of financial modeling for startups and we have to model the expected cash flow. And when you're modeling that, you always expect a certain day is payable and a certain day is receivable. And 
the assumption that you're making there is very interesting. Most times you're assuming you're going to pay your bills at the latest date humanly possible, because that's what you should do to optimize cash, right? If your bills are due net 15, you should pay them on that due date, because otherwise you're shrinking your cash for no reason. Um, but And for accounts receivables, um, to be conservative, you'd want to assume the same of your customers, that they're going to pay on the due date and no day sooner. But the reality really, when you actually play out the business is you do sometimes pay early, you do sometimes pay late, uh, your customers sometimes can pay early. So the, the reality hits and, and you notice different trends. Um, I think that one should um, set their net payables uh, or set their net receivables at a date that they can afford to get paid by. Like if you are gonna run out of cash, if you wait 90 days, you cannot afford a net 90 payable. Um, and so you kind of set your expectations there. But um, we spoke earlier about how folks who, and, and, and this is extrapolating a little bit, but folks who pay early uh, tend to pay. And if you, and if, if you pay late enough, you, uh, then it's uh, indicative that you might not pay for a very long time. And there is sort of this magic to getting someone to just pay early and getting it over with. So you might implement some kind of incentive or automatic payment or something to get it in even earlier just to kind of lock that payment in um, and as the customer who's paying in that methodology if you're going to opt into that you are then you know paying a bit early and so that incentive needs to be worth it to you um, that's sort of the balance of how i think about it yeah and I, and I guess there's some elements that work on kind of both sides in the sense that you know i, I assume in some of your companies uh you've asked like vendors for quarterly payments, uh, you know, to pay them. And that's actually an important element of the negotiation of the contract. That's also something that you can implement with your own customers. You know, we talked about payments plans earlier and how to make those easy. So I guess there's also these extra or around like payments elements that, fa that factor into that, right? Yeah, payments can totally be part of a negotiation. If your business negotiates each contract and has sort of a complex, um, contract revenue stream, then it can be one of the factors that helps you win the deal if you're willing to be flexible on payment, as you've mentioned. Um, so sometimes it's essential and, and especially powerful if cash flow is less important than profit to your particular company. We've covered our three main topic areas. I think we've probably come to the end of, of discussing those things. Um, I wonder if a nice way to finish, and we think about what has triggered this event is the, the state of B2B payments, which is a sit rep of what's happening in B2B payments right now. I wonder if a nice way to finish would be to say, if we hypothesize about doing this again in a year's time, what would we expect in our product, in your product, in your customers, in your business that we would be seeing in terms of the payment trend that's going to happen over the next 12 months? I mean, that's an interesting way to, uh, to wrap up the session. I don't know if anyone wants to go first on that. What's coming next? Well, I'm thinking with, you know, with the explosion of AI, we might have like large language models really just being plugged in and acting as like a collections rep for a company. Just like if someone responds to your AR email address, you know, they can respond back. If they're asking for invoices, they can respond back with invoices, follow up on payments and just essentially like maybe summarize the conversation with the customers. So I feel like that's probably something that's not too Almost far. It's like an RPA type robotic process automation yeah, type thing. Yeah, and like these large language models are so good now that I, I'm sure someone's already like has something working on that right now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Got something in the works, Brad, no? <laughs> I, I think from the, the Stripe perspective, sort of talked about it a little bit, but I think we're just going to see increasing desire for flexible payment options. And I think we're going to see companies play around with different payment models. We've seen usage based billing actually sort of t take off pretty dramatically in the last 12 months. You know, we see it with the proliferation of AI and having metered billing. Um, there are companies have a larger appetite to try different methods for charging their customers um, in a way that makes sense for their customers. and. If they don't know what that is today, um, I think we're going to see more experimentation. You were talking about working with startups who are constantly trying to iterate different ways in which they engage their customers, charge their customers, um, 
figure out ways to get paid, you know, upfront faster, but maybe have more flexible terms. And so I think, you know, if we have this conversation 12 months from now, I don't have the answer, but I imagine um, we're going to be having conversations about, you know, new ways of, of um, charging customers um, in a way that that offers more flexibility to, you know, how they how they want to uh, how they want to be paid. I would, I would echo Matt's point and also a lot of the things that we've been discussing today is that what we're going to be focusing on is developing more functionality, more features to uh, make it easier uh, to get paid, make it easier to pay uh, for uh, the payee. Uh, you know, we've talked about like installments, new payment methods, the ability, and also something that's quite specific to B2B is deep integration into the other workflows of the companies across teams into the ERP uh, and actually and around the ERP into the CRM as well. Um, so all of that, we're going to work on the, the integration, uh, the easiness uh, and the depth of the functionality that we offer to our B2B merchants as they get more and more sophisticated, just like their customers on that uh, payments uh, pillar. So. I think, um, you know, I think I'm more of a receiver of all these payment technologies. So as a receiver, to kind of synthesize what I'm hearing, I'm hearing about a lot of amazing kind of innovations and automations. I'm hearing about a lot of ability to, to be flexible in what kinds of ways we're uh, doing payments and integration. And I think what's interesting is sort of these are all necessary to happen at once. Because if we want automation, there needs to be that in-depth integration and there needs to be the flexibility to have that work in different ways. So we're not just like stuck with these single types of payment options. And so what I'm, I guess, anticipating is watching all of these kind of things happen in lockstep. And when they all happen at pace, things are really good for me as someone who's trying to implement them because I have what I need to get the kind of payment method done that I want for my product. And if one of them outstrips the other, it's going to be hairy and a little bit painful for a while because there's an automation, but it doesn't work for my business, so I can't use it. Or there's an integration, but there's no automation, so it's not helpful. So I, I see the, the, the lock sync of those things happening at once being really important. You know, I think there's, there's, a, there's a give get for the, the payer and the payee experience. And, you know, we were talking about, you know, all, all this cash and check that still happens. And I think the, the sort of, um, you know, if, if, if a business is able to offer more flexible payment options and payment plans, I think the thing that they should expect to ask in return for the customer, and which ultimately will make their lives easier, hopefully, is by bringing those payments online. And I think that's, we continue to see the proliferation of payments online. Um, and I think we would expect to see that attendant conversion of payments from offline to online, um, because when payments are processed online, you can, it is more easy to offer these flexible payment options yeah. and that they flow into your accounting software. So you're not having someone in your back office, mark a check is paid and you know uh, manually reconciled. Um, and so I think there's, there's good incentives for all parties. And I think we'll see that flexibility come hand in hand with payments moving online. Lauren, going back to what you said, do you think the space that we're in is being innovation driven? And as these technology providers provide more effective technology, the merchants are jumping on and utilizing that technology? Or do you think it's more demand driven in that merchants are sitting back thinking, I wish I had X, Y, Z, I wish I was able to do uh, this with the technology or processes that I currently can't? Um, I think it might be both. I think. Um there's certain a lot there's certainly a lot of innovation driving this change because it's really a kind of a hot area for startups of um, creating solutions in the space um, but i think there's also a lot of appetite for it i think uh, becoming a cfo in um, technology driven organizations has been really interesting because you're in a space where the ceo is an engineer and describing how finance works to an engineer is always a really funny conversation, right? They're like, oh, so this just happens in an automated way. And you have to describe, no, mm -hmm. actually, this is always going to be late. It takes 10 days to process. It's a high assurance system of record. It's not like a real time system. Um, so there's a lot of kind of disbelief at the way that finance works and a little bit of impatience with what is the norm. So in that way, I think there is sort of that demand drive of uh, operators having higher expectations of things like payments and really wanting it to work 
at the pace that the rest of the world works. Um, so I think that also is driving some of that innovation. I think it's a really interesting point thinking about the, the, the demand that exists in the market. Um, we're seeing a significant demand as upflow um, for more capability to think about the customer and to think about how to engage the customer in this financial pillar um, in a way that isn't entirely driven by the invoice. So rather than being invoice driven in our communications, we want to be customer driven and customer focused in our communications with the invoice as the catalyst for the discussion. Um, and we're seeing a lot of people wanting to think more about this is yes about how we get paid, but it's also about how we engage with the customer in a way that creates a positive customer experience, that enhances the relationship, that doesn't alienate them, that doesn't create a driver for churn, and ultimately helps drive the growth of the business as they, as they go forward. And that kind of more relationship management part of the financial dialogue is something that Upflow is pouring into uh, in much more in much more much more meaningful ways. Um, so I think it's a good place to to, to wrap the discussion. Thanks everyone for coming. We've uh, we've had a great time here on this uh, not silent rooftop, but very uh, very pleasant place to be. Um, I did say at the beginning of the session that there was only going to be one plug in the session, but I'm going to go against that uh, and actually make a second one. Uh, Lauren is uh, involved with our CEO in creating a podcast series that you can sign up for here. Um, that is focused on the growth-minded CFO, so how to use the cash flow uh, and cash inflow as a, a growth driver for the business. So we're very excited about that. Please follow that and, and absorb the content. And uh, thanks very much for joining us today.